Welcome to Regent TV, Episode 5, and Happy New Year, everybody. Tonight, we've got a very special episode for you. In fact, our featured guests, our conversation this evening with Chachi Lepret and Eric Taros, two of the uh, most uh, prominent Beatles scholars, historians, uh, enthusiasts around today. But first, before we get to that, let's talk about some of the featured shows we have for February 2020. I'm sure you've heard of it. Plenty of fish. <laughs> POF. Yes. A free dating site. Proving once again, you get what you don't pay for. <laughs> plenty of freaks, plenty of disappointments. There's a whole moon meaning to the phrase meet, greet, then delete. <laughs> I love reading a Latina's profile on Plenty of Fish. She's 42 and all her kids are over 30. <laughs> And she's a grandmother. <laughs> so I met this one woman on POF. We're talking on the phone. We're having a nice conversation. And I innocently asked her, I go, oh, so Suzanne, what is it you do for a living? Well, I do fundraising for the Alzheimer's Foundation. I go, well, that's a noble cause. Then we go into a different topic. Then a minute later, she blurts out, you know, I do fundraising for the Alzheimer's Foundation. <laughs> Now I'm thinking I have to do a fundraiser for her. <laughs> We have a few Beatles fans out there this evening watching, and uh, I hope so because we've got two of the most prominent Beatles enthusiasts around here for our conversation tonight, which I'm quite excited about. We've got Chachi Lepret, Beatles historian, longtime host of Breakfast with the Beatles, and Eric Taros, Beatles archivist or film archivist to be precise and uh, acclaimed for the, your work and Thank you. among other things uh, contributed to the uh, eight days a week film. Yeah, that's so, probably my biggest hit. Yeah, <laughs> so welcome to Regent TV. The topic of the Beatles, we could go on forever and we're just getting started, but uh, why don't we start with you guys 
telling us, tell the audience, where did you get start? When did it all begin for you? Because a lot of people are passionate about the Beatles, but you both have worked this into something even more than just a fan passion. Yeah, and I'll go first, but yeah. first of all, it's great to be here with Leland. Is Leland is a legendary guy he from is. Arlington, Mass. Runs the Regent Theater, and we're happy to be here with you. Oh, we love the Regent. Oh, we should we say, love the Regent. Yeah, we, I mean, it's it is really like we when we played the Regent in October with a, a different version of our show. Um, I was thrilled because I've seen so many cool rock and roll things there, and to finally be on that stage was uh, that was really where, that's, that's why we want to keep coming back. And yeah. I should say the reason one of the reasons you're here tonight is to uh, talk about the upcoming show yes. you're doing yes. called Here, There, and Everywhere: The mm -hmm. Beatles in the USA on. Uh, Saturday, February 8th. That's correct. But, uh, you but know, let me stop. Let's hear about how we got to this point. I was born in Cambridge. And I used to come to Arlington when I was a kid and eat ice cream at Buttricks. And Arlington was formerly West Cambridge. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. So I grew, I grew up in Cambridge. And uh, I am a first generation Beatle fan. I was roughly seven years old, February 9th, 1964, on the Ed Sullivan Show, watching them at home with my family two older brothers and an older sister and it was even though I was young seven years old it's an evening I will never forget it's embedded in my head how it was so impactful in my life and it and it changed my life I immediately like all the kids at school wanted to be a beetle wanted to have the girls chasing us and we were buying beetle wigs and and all of that the boots and it, we were just totally into the Beatles back then and throughout the 60s, I followed them religiously, collected things, and kept them as much as I could before my mother would throw them out. But I kept the majority of the stuff. And for me, you know, the Beatles, I was blessed to figure out what I wanted to do in life at a very young age. Mm -hmm. you know, roughly when I went into high school, I knew I wanted to be a, a DJ simply to meet and interview the Beatles. Because I couldn't be a Beatle, there were already four. Yeah. And I wanted to, and I heard the DJs and the TV guys interviewing them, and I'm like, I'd love to meet the Beatles. So I focused on becoming a DJ, and roughly, you know, 1970, I started in high school. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to be a DJ when I turned on WBCN. Charles Laquadera, the two, the two things that really <coughs> made me do what I wanted to be in my life were the Beatles and WBCN radio. And so both of them kind of hit each other in the early 70s. And by 1981, I was blessed to be, a D to be on WBCN. And I had a Beatles show by the mid-80s called Get Back to the Beatles, which became Breakfast with the Beatles. So that's how it all started with me. Wow. And now, uh, 2020, the Beatles split up 50 years ago, right? 50 years ago in April. Yes. Yeah. Um, but... The split up meant nothing in terms of the Beatles phenomenon, and here we are, 50 years later. So, yeah. How about you, Eric? Me. Your um, start. Oh with, my. As a Beatles. Yeah. My start Not. was. It was very. I was younger than Josh, <laughs> but uh, my, I had an older sister who um, made sat us down as a family to watch the first Ed Sullivan show. My biggest memory of that is actually I was really into Bonanza, as I loved horses. I was little, and I'm like, yeah. I don't want to see. I'm like, Come on, I want. You know, I was probably having a temper tantrum. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that all went away the second I saw these guys, and it was mesmerizing. I remember, like, they all kind of looked the same, and the crazy, it, the hair really, and their presentation, I think, mm. really burned into the mind. And I was, I was in. So from there, I had, like, a little transistor radio, like a lot of kids did. Uh, always had a little bit of trouble sleeping, so I used to fall asleep with the radio going under the pillow, and I'd listen to Bruce Bradley, um, not so much to uh, not so much to WMEX, which was uh, mm -hmm. Woo Woo Ginsburg, but but definitely yeah. Bruce on WBZ, and uh, it just kept going and going. Eventually, what kicked me into the where I am now, I think, was um, my grandmother died in 1966, and she was like the closest person I was to in, in the family. And right at that time, they announced that the Beatles were playing Suffolk Downs, and it had this sort of magical effect on me. Something changed that day. And then, you know, my, I asked my mother, you know, can we go see the Beatles? And she's like, they'll be back when you're older. 
Yeah. <laughs> He'll say no. <laughs> but obviously, 11 days later, they played their final show after, you know, after Suffolk Downs. So something clicked in my head. And from that moment on, uh, I had a teenage radio show on WBZ FM. And I met a guy who was promoting Mystery Tour 75 by the name of Joe Pope. He ran a magazine called Strawberry Fields Forever. Uh, which were, and he invented the Beatles conventions. That's what these okay. mystery tour things were. And he kind of took me under his wing. He's a lot older than me, um, but he introduced me into the world of Uber collectors, and I got to know who Johnny V was, and I got to know who Jason Brabazon was, and Peter Kunkel, and all these legends of the underground of collecting. And so I always tell people, I st no, no particular talent of mine. I stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm. It's, it's, you know, just thinking back, and I, I had the good fortune of growing up in the 60s and having older brothers that had their fingers on the pulse of everything that was going on in music, but to me, some of the Beatles, the things I most remember are list, being in the car, my parents' car, and the Beatles coming on the radio. I mean, the top 40 radio in those days, was, that's, that's how you heard music, and the Beatles, year after year after year, month after month, you know, they new releases I can hear I I feel fine I, I remember hearing that she's a woman ticket to ride all those songs and as a you know even as a preteen there was something like the, the energy behind it it, it was just incredible it, it was amazing it was an amazing time to be alive because you remember and and you do too Eric it was non-stop mm -hmm. there was always a Beatle record in the top 10 there was one coming out there was one just wrapping up it seemed like it was every six months you know if certainly there was like five albums in 1964 oh, the yeah. capital released yeah and so it was really an amazing time but I remember as a kid my, my father never had a radio in the car but everything changed when he bought a Dodge Coronet <laughs> and it had a radio <laughs> and it was like my god we have a radio and you're right because yeah we would listen to the radio oh, yeah. all the time, and the Beatles were always on, and you were either listening to the, t the number one Beatles song, getting ready for the next record to come out. I mean, it, it was nonstop. But, but do you guys remember one thing that's lost to time, and I would call this the Big Chill effect. Mm -hmm. When this movie, The Big Chill, came out in the 80s, mm -hmm. they made it seem like, oh, yeah, when you listen to the radio in the 60s, it was Motown, Motown, Beatles, Motown, Motown. You know, it wasn't that way at all. You'd hear Frank Sinatra doing Strangers in the Night, right. and then mm -hmm. it would be Paperback Writer, and then yeah. it would be... Yeah. Love is Blue or something, yeah, you know, yeah. some instrumental. Yeah. So I kind of miss that part of the 60s. And it was yeah. always great, I think, to hear the Beatles in the context of what they came to kill, yeah. if you know what I mean. Like, they just blew everybody else away. But if, yeah. you, if you go back and you actually put them in the context, the records are even more impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and one of the things is, okay, so we were, you know, kids in the 60s, and now... Flash forward to, you know, 2020 and the 2000s, and it's safe to say that there are people, kids our age, or who are who are our age back then, are now Beatles fans because of their grandparents, their parents, yes. and so forth. And I guess there are other things, other phenomena you could say that about. But I think the Beatles is one that's very much alive and very very prominent still yeah. and in and, and your work do you come across that a lot are you I mean it must I mean that has to be one of the more rewarding things to see young people and young kids who you know were born yesterday and are like it is amazing like I, have, I my show is breakfast with the Beatles on the radio and I have a nine-year-old listener who sent me an email the other day with a request and he wanted to hear all together now which makes sense for a nine-year-old yeah and temporary secretary, Paul McCartney. <laughs> and I'm like, look at this discerning nine-year-old. So I played it on the show last week, and I said, this goes out to Peter. He's nine years old. He requested these for his birthday. The kid in him wants to hear all together now. The adult in him yeah. wants to hear temporary secretary. But that has a weird rhythm to it, temporary it secretary. Does. I mean, it's a very strange That's song. a quirky little tune. Quirky and is right. I run into it. I, I speak at high schools, especially in Swampscott, where yeah. I live, and uh, I speak to a media class there. And it always knocks me out when these kids will say, oh, yeah, I grew up singing, you know, and, they, and they'll know little facts about certain songs. Sometimes they'll come to me and say, after I've given a speech or whatever, 
class, they go, oh, I didn't know that song was also a Beatles song, because I know that song. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hear, you know, my grandmother's house and my dad's house. So it, it does seem to be unlike, I think a lot of kids have appreciation for, you know, Elvis or Buddy Holly, sure. but it's, it's different. It's a little bit more alive yeah. than, you know, it, that seems to be very, very couched in the past. Whereas yeah. the Beatle thing kind of, you know, a lot of them, they gain entry through Yellow Submarine. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, like the, the whole Elvis thing seems to be fading away. But, well, it's yeah. a long time. You know? It's been dead It's 40. been a long yeah. time, but the Beatles are still as strong as ever. It it's doesn't amazing. seem to be going anywhere. Yeah. And, and there was a fallow period. I mean, people forget, you know, when I, I'm kind of spent a lot of, uh, I spent a lot of time in the past. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, look at an old news film or whatever. Uh, I found this thing, I might even show it at our show at the Regent. Um, where I, I was on Channel 5 to speak on behalf of Strawberries Records, where I was working, yeah. on the 20th anniversary of the first Beatles record, which was Love Me Do. So this is October 1982. And there was a little tiny, it was starting to build again. There In the mid-70s, the Capitol re-released. They came out with the rock and roll music, and they started re-releasing the albums. And that's kind of where it started to build back up again. Um, but I think there was a period in the very early 70s where it was quiet, before yeah, 74. Yeah, I'd yeah. say between 70 and 74, the Beatle thing was kind of fading away a little bit. Yeah. But boy, did it come back from 74. From the 10th anniversary onward, push, yeah. it, it was no looking back, really. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, and it's great because, you know, just like I say, there's a new generation, but also uh, the excitement of bringing together Beatles fans, whether it's at a, mm -hmm. the conventions that mm -hmm. you're aware of, or through your radio show, mm -hmm. or in some kind of a, a, an event, a live presentation like we're doing at the Regent. And I often say what we do at the Regent is, is fantastic, because we bring together these different communities of people, whether it's an ethnic community, a cultural community, or just people who are enthusiastic about one thing or another. Yeah. And it really creates a special vibe and energy. So uh, we're, we're excited to have you guys. Well, it's great yeah. to be back because it's great to be back to the region because th these theaters are important to people. Mm -hmm. Eric and I, I'll tell you, and I, I know I know what he's going to say. <laughs> I remember with such uh, you know in my heart such love for the first theater I saw, Hard Day's Night in. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the Coolidge Theater in Watertown doesn't exist it became a jack-in-the-box <laughs> and I recently found a picture of it, 1964 this old theater and I know you saw, where did you see a hard day's night I saw a hard day's night and help as a double feature at the Oriental in Mattapan so wow. when so kids come to our show at the region they're gonna remember the region yeah. for a long time yeah. uh, because these venues the, especially yours the region is such a unique venue and there's not many of them around anymore and so, you know, a hundred year old plus theater and for us to be on stage, because Eric was saying to me, you know, yeah. the fact that vaudeville performers are on the stage is so, it's so important that we're on it. It's so meaningful. It's, it's funny what uh, you mentioned it and not to get too sidetracked, but uh, a, a few months ago we had the f a 40th anniversary of the screening of the Who film, The Kids Are All Right. Oh. And you don't know how many people came who were at the Regent Theater 40 years before wow. and saw it there and of, of course that ended with the kids like ripping up their seats and uh, You're causing kidding. a riot and they had destroyed to close the theater? for a while. Wow. So in, in true <laughs> Who fashion oh, but uh, anyway but oh, it's uh, yeah those are those are certainly memories that we ha all, all have. Yeah. I um, saw Help at the <clears throat> Fresh Pond Drive-In. Okay. You know where all the electrical things are on the parkway there? Yeah. That used to be the Fresh Pond Drive-In. That's where I saw Help. Roughly where the Apple Cinemas are now. Yeah, right across right the street. There. And yeah. I saw Let It Be at the Apple Cinema. That's crazy. In so 1970. Tell us, give us a taste or a tease of, of the type of things that you're going to be presenting at the region on February 8th. February 8th, Saturday. Yeah. Well, you know, you're mentioning, Chachi, about the memorable uh, aspect of going to a theater to see this. One of the coolest things about what we're showing is you cannot see this stuff anywhere. You can go get help, you can go get Hard Day's Night, but uh, the, the pieces that Chachi and I present um, come from my work, a lot of, of finding things and uncovering lost films, which is what I did for Ron Howard in Eight Days a Week. But that process is always going on. I was just called Chachi the other day. I said, oh, I found a film, you know, I just got, it's coming this week, and it might be a missing performance from the Cavern Club. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing process for me. The kinds of things you're going to see, um, we're, this particular show, because it's on February 8th, we would like to kind of ease people back into that time uh, mm. 55 years ago. 
And so you're going to see some stuff that the Beatles actually end Central Park on February 8, 1964, but you're going to see some of their arrival. Um, one of the things I put together that's, unless you've come to see my show, <laughs> you won't see it. Um, <laughs> their very first press conference at JFK Airport was incredibly historically significant for the Beatles because it was such a success, which it wasn't planned to be, that it changed what they did in every new city. They, every new city from that moment on, they did a press conference because in the words of their press agent at the time, the marvelous experience at JFK proved that the Beatles were just as interesting when they were speaking mm -hmm. or, or talking to the press as they were on stage. So we're going to see that's never been seen in its correct order. Bits and pieces of it, you know, the way people chop up things for news today. We show it in, in its natural form. So you can actually see how this mm. cynical press that are ready to really skewer these English kids they're, they're like eating out of their hands within five minutes. So it's, it's kind of an interesting piece, but lots of music. Um, and we, the subtitle of the show is The Beatles in the USA. So you're going to see some stuff across the Beatles experience in America. Some really rare footage from San Francisco in 65. You're going to see a song, uh, She's a Woman, from Shea Stadium, which was never in the original film. And it's been reconstructed from people's home movies and some news footage. Uh, and some outtakes. So there's all kinds of surprises. There's also going to be um, some footage from the Beatles' very last show uh, in San Francisco in 1966, as well as Chachi will tell you about what another part about our Boston thing. Yes, well, <laughs> Boston was important. You know that when they played Suffolk Downs, they were going to come back for another show for Eric. <laughs> but they never <laughs> did. And so Eric, Eric's an amazing film archivist, and I've known him for a long time. He is a historian, and his collection of films is beyond anyone's uh, you know, belief when you see the stuff he has. And so we're going to dig into Suffolk Downs and the mayhem that, mm. that surrounded that show. Uh, and you know the Kennedy family were there. Lots of very prominent people were there. Brad Delp uh, yeah. was there. Johnny A was there. So. Uh, there's going to be a lot of footage from that. Yes, show. a lot of footage from that and a lot of uh, mm. witnesses uh, who I've interviewed over mm -hmm. the years. My favorite being the great John Lubinsky. Lubinsky. There's this one guy that, um, well, there was a great comedian that I ended up working for for like a day in England. His name was Kenny Everett. And at this mm. time, he was a, a DJ on a ship, on a pirate ship off the coast of England. But the Beatles loved him. They, he did a morning drive show. So they invited him to come on their final tour as like a roving reporter for Radio London, which was the ship that he worked on. So Kenny would just walk around the show with a tape recorder looking for a story. And he was a natural comedian, so he's, his stories are funny. He sees this guy lurking around the stage. And he goes up to him and he says, who are you? And John Lubinsky says, I'm John Lubinsky from Malden, Mass. <laughs> well, what are you doing here, John? Well, I'm going to jump up on stage and meet the Beatles. He says, well, you better do it quick, because this is the last song. They were doing Long Tall Sally. Yeah. And <clears throat> John just broke into a, a run jumped up on the stage, he hugged John, he hugged Paul. So meanwhile, Kenny is calling the play-by-play. -play. Yeah, he's, and, he's grabbing John, he's got wow. George. And now they've got him. Yes. And they <laughs> threw him headlong off the stage. Well, believe it or not, we have two camera angles of that mm. and the play-by-play. And the -play. So you'll actually get to live a little of that. And as a bonus, John Lubinsky came out from Las Vegas the summer, and the two of us went to Suffolk Downs, and he took me through his stages of, mm. this is where I broke into the show, and this is where he jumped up on the stage. So you see a little bit of John Lubinsky today as oh, well. Oh, wonderful. So. That's, you know, you mentioned Brad Delp, and I had to have to say, in the context of the Regent Theater and our history, we had quite a history with Brad Delp, for those uh, Beatles tuning Beatles. in, yeah. was, of course, the lead singer of Boston, but his real, real passion was the Beatles and his group Beatles. Juice, mm -hmm. they performed many, many times at the region and just an amazing singer where he would do the uh, George Harrison vocals, John Lennon vocals, Paul McCartney, it didn't matter. Uh, but it sounds as if that might have been his, uh, you know, light going off in his head, mm -hmm. like moment seeing the Beatles yeah. at Suffolk yeah, Downs. He had said that, yeah. Well, you'll hear a little <laughs> bit of Brad. Funny you would mention that, uh, because a, a very strange story about that yeah. is that I, um, through a couple of friends, I called up Brad before he died, and I explained what I was doing. And the only reason I knew Brad had any connection besides Beetlejuice was of this article I read in uh, Boston Phoenix. It was mm -hmm. beautiful, in-depth. It was all about his adventure, you know, at, uh, at uh, Suffolk Downs. 
So I said, wow, I, I got to get a hold of this guy. So I talked to him, and he said, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a little busy. We'll, we'll, okay, we set a date for two weeks yeah. from then. He died in between. Oh, so goodness. I figured, okay, that's it. Mm. So here's where fate intervenes. I'm at my bank, of all things. I'm sure people laughing in the audience, <laughs> goes to a bank. <laughs> so I was at a bank, and I was talking to the teller who knew me, and everybody in the town knows I'm doing this movie. So she goes, well, we have to go to the bank manager to sort this out. And as we're walking in the manager's office, she says, by the way, how's that Beatles movie? I said, still going. This is the movie about Suffolk Downs I've been right, right. making for years and years. Bank manager says, I love the Beatles. What's all this about a Beatles movie? So I had to explain it to him. And as I get through this, he says, did you ever talk to Brad Delt? I don't know how I was supposed to, but uh, he goes, yeah, because you know, my wife uh, interviewed him for the Boston Phoenix and blah, blah, blah. And I go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Is your wife so-and-so? And turns out she still had her tapes and oh, she let boy. me have them. So you wow. will hear a little bit of Brad and what you'll also hear, which is tons of fun, one of Brad, Brad was in a high school band called The Monks. Mm -hmm. Not The Monkees and not The Monks from Germany, but The Monks. And um, one of the band members came down. And so you will hear a little bit of Brad in high school uh, singing uh, Paperback Writer. Oh, cool. He was teaching, and it's funny you mentioned about all the different vocals, because apparently, according to this band member, he'd teach the bassist how to do it the right way. He'd teach the guitarist how to play it. So he really, even at that age, was just consumed with it. Yeah, so, so we're pretty excited to be at the Regents again. This is our second time. Yeah. We were there in October, and we're coming back with Here, There, and Everywhere, The Beatles in the USA, two hours of unseen films, and we're going to tell stories. and. Yeah. Involve the audience a bit. A lot of people like to ask questions, and we give away Beatles vinyl, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. We love coming back to the region, Absolutely. and they have the best popcorn. They have the best popcorn. <laughs> the you best can popcorn. have a. You know what's so nice though? It's like you can have a beer. You're in this historic place. Yes. But you can have a beer. You can have the popcorn. You mill around. You will meet other Beatles people, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, it's always just it's it's so much history in that building. I actually remember being thrilled to watch the original Barry and the Remains, who opened for the Beatles at Suffolk Downs, on your very stage. Um, you know, God, this has got to be 10, 12 years ago now. Actually, I think it was 2005 or two, two, 2003. Well, right. we had them a couple times, but... This was that yeah. day at the... We, like a night at the surf, yeah. I think it was what it was called. It was fantastic. Yeah. And, and Arnie Ginsberg came down to MC it. It was... I mean, mm -hmm. just amazing. Well, yeah. we love to do the multimedia stuff because we have the big screen and we have the stage, and events like yours are the perfect ones for us and our audience. So we're uh, going to welcome you back with open arms and this time awesome. and hopefully many times in the future. Well, yeah. we can't wait because we were just there for Denny Lane. Yeah, and that right. was a lot of fun. There so you go. we love Leland and what he brings to Arlington and to the theater. It's just, a, you know, you're a great man. It's a unique experience. I'd say anybody who's watching this, um, yeah. it really is. You'll never see this stuff on YouTube, trust me. Yeah. Some things you might have seen bits and pieces on YouTube, but not like this. This is all out of private collection, and we're, Chachi and I are working on a film together, so yeah. we're, we're kind of using this as testing pieces. Like, mm -hmm. oh, what do people like? Do they like this? Do they like that better? So it's, um, it's test marketing for us, and it's a unique kind of one-off experience. If you like the Beatles at all, I guarantee you'll, you'll raise a smile. As this yeah. I tell you, he surprises me with the stuff he brings. I, I can't I'm, wait. I, can't really wait. I don't amazing. think I can wait until then. So uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be patient, and we'll see now, you Did you ever see the Beatles? Approach. I never did see did the Beatles. Did you ever see Jimi Hendrix? I never saw Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> oh, Hendrix. no. See, so you should be making a Hendrix movie. But I tell saw that to story. Me. Tell but, the story said, how your brother well, didn't take you to see Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, that was 50 years ago, the uh, <laughs> Fillmore East in New York City. Uh, Have you spoken to him since? Yeah. Yeah. No worries. You know, he'll, so he'll I did be see back. Bob Marley and the Whalers at the Rainbow Theater in London oh, in 1977. Wow. Now, see, you know, Eric worked at concert. the BBC. Yeah, I did when I was a, a wee a wee lad. Yeah. Well, you know, we have so much. To talk. We could go on for a long time, so maybe yeah. we can make a new show. Beatles TV. We would love TV. to do that. Sure, Beatles yeah. TV at the <laughs> region. Yeah. But thanks for coming. You guys came from the far reaches of metropolitan Boston, so thanks for coming. And, uh, well, we'll we would do anything for you. Arlington Showplace yeah. of Entertainment. Such a dear friend. It is a showplace of entertainment. It is. Carry on. Cool.